My name is Tom Fisher and I'm a member of the American Society for Cybernetics. What I'm trying to do with this presentation is connect a review of some of Wiener's writing to today's cybernetic design theory. Cybernetic design theory is a, is, it's a growing connection between cybernetics and design uh, at a number of levels. Design is increasingly described in cybernetic terms. Cybernetics has adopted the term design as a central theme, uh, epistemological, uh, as a metaphor for epistemological processes. And uh, for us in the ASC, design is also a, probably the strongest draw for new members. It has significant interest. When we look at what cybernetics and design have in common, I'm sampling here a little bit in the work of mainly Stuart Uppelby and Andrew Pickering, a couple of keywords that connect old ontology, epistemology, to more cybernetic epistemology, going from linear causality to circular causality, from determinism to indeterminism, from observer being included to the observer being included, and from descriptive to being performative. These are basically, there's more differences between these two different paradigms, but these are the ones that I'm particularly excited about. And this basically draws a picture where design and cybernetics have a strong mutual compatibility, and either one of them has a certain incompatibility with conventional uh, natural science. What I will do in this talk in particular is I'm, I've sampled these nine points in the literature, and there is probably much more. And out of those nine, I'm going to talk about six, because I have to make time choices, six dimensions or ideas, notions, where I think Wiener's thinking and acting was uncannily in line with today's design cybernetics. And I'm going to illustrate that with some um, yeah, juxtapositions, basically, uh, between today's design theory and some of his writings. And what inspired me to do that is this book. I think this is going to be mentioned a couple of times uh, during the conference. This is a manuscript, uh, uh, it's a book based on a manuscript that he wrote in the early 1950s to mid-1950s on innovation uh, up to the point when he lost interest in dealing with the topic on an expository level and he became interested in writing the tempter, the novel. And he abandoned, he abandoned this manuscript and it was published in 1993 in a state that we must assume he was not happy with. Still, it is a very interesting book to look at how he thought about design. And what we need to keep in mind here is that when he wrote this, design was not talked about in the terms that we talk about design today, as something that warrants a, a philosophical reflection. Design was not thought of as a process of inquiry or as an academic discipline. So had he dealt with this body of ideas today, he might have as well chosen the term design, but he used the word innovation. And where he applied the term innovation to himself, he mainly referred to his own process of producing mathematical models. Nonetheless, it's quite applicable to design, I believe. So Herbert Simon, on the design side, defined design as devising courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Analogously, Wiener defined feedback as the property of being able to adjust future conduct by past performance. So this connection of what can be evaluated to what shall be attained is manifest in anti-aircraft artillery, which Wiener sought to automate. And this is the connection of two causal modes, causa efficientis, because of something that has happened and causa finalis in order to achieve something in the future. The connection of the prescriptive agenda of natural science on the one hand and the forward-looking agendas of design and engineering on the other hand. So the first point in this space is ethics. Design theorists Rittel and Weber call design problems wicked problems. This is 
pretty well known now. And they contrast wicked problems with tame problems because they transcend existing frameworks of judgment. Second order cybernetician Heinz von Förster points out that only we can decide the undecidable. And thereby he frames human action in the presence of wicked, open-ended problems as ethical. Age 20, Wiener published a paper in which he addressed the question of whether an ultimate highest good exists, an ultimate framework of judgment, and he concludes that it doesn't exist. There is no highest good. If such an external ideal would exist and could be attained, then on its attainment moral progress ceases. And, it cannot be and if it cannot be attained, then morality is a perpetual failure, Wiener writes. Instead, he bases ethics on internal guidance. And he writes, it is only the instinctive feeling within which urges us to respect the consciousness and prejudices of other human beings, which prevents us from overriding the consciousness and prejudices of others when they conflict with our own. And Wiener's absence from the Manhattan Project, his views on the use of nuclear weapons on civilians, his concerns for the effects of automation on the working masses, and so on, are evidence that he lived by the kind of internal ethical standards that he described. And this notion of internal standards, internal guidance, takes us to the difference between the descriptive agenda of science and the performative forward-looking search agenda of cybernetics, which has been pointed out by Andrew Pickering, and which cybernetics actually shares with design. And to illustrate that, consider, as a timely metaphor, soccer. There's a difference between performing as a player on the field or from the sideline as a coach. Both players and coach influence the proceedings of the game, but depending on whether one operates within or outside of the boundaries projected around the system under consideration, the insider is disposed to react by reference within. For example, where should I pass the ball now? While the outsider is disposed to describe by reference to something outside, for example, devising an overall plan of which player should be used, how much, at what stage during a tournament. So when Andrew Pickering explains that cybernetics has a performative agenda as opposed to the descriptive agenda of natural science, which you didn't mention this morning, but that's what you say in the book, then I think this refers pretty much to this, uh, this difference. And when cyberneticians like Walter Gray and Norbert Wiener were interested in tortoise robots, this was not simply because those robots were challenging engineering projects, but because those robots were metaphors for those cyberneticians' own mode of internally guided performance. Performance before description. The difference between performance and description becomes very clear when we are concerned with practices that depend on tested knowing rather than explicit knowledge, and the type of knowledge that can only be learned by speculative doing as opposed to learning by reading. This applies to riding a bicycle as much as it relates to the practice of design. It also applies to the inventive and creative aspects of science and mathematics as practiced by Norbert Wiener. And he wrote on this specifically, the practicing mathematician knows very well that mathematics as a living investigation is inductive and experimental, whatever it may become when stuffed and mounted in textbooks. So this process which takes us from not knowing to knowing through action begins from ignorance. And Ranulph Glanville, who I think is the central figure between, uh, in the intersection between cybernetics and design, values ignorance as the source of knowing. And this is captured in his notion of the black box, which was um, mentioned before. So when Ranulph received a doctorate of science from Brunel University's, uh, University a few years ago, which was his third doctorate degree, Søren Bria wrote an article calling him the cybernetician of ignorance because of the degree to which he values ignorance in, as a backdrop 
uh, for epistemological practice. And what most design cyberneticians don't know, including Randall, I asked him, Rina actually wrote about ignorance, the whole theory of ignorance, when he was aged 11. His graduation thesis at Aya High School is titled The Theory of Ignorance. Inside it's called The Theory of General Ignorance. And yesterday I went to the MIT archives and I got this, this copy, which was magic. And in it, he basically makes the case for the impossible of uh, certain and complete knowledge. And he's arguing essentially around Socrates stating that true knowledge exists in knowing that you don't know. And this is a paradoxical statement along the lines of the liar's paradox, I am a liar, and the set theory paradox of the set containing all sets that don't contain itself, having to contain itself. Um, so, this is very much along the lines of Glendale's appreciation of uh, ignorance. The metaphor that he uses in his writing is what he calls the grabbing hand universe. I'm not going to go into that now, but it's basically uh, an argument on the basis of uh, Gödel's incompleteness idea, which Gödel published 25 years after Dina, aged 11, make essentially the same argument. So, this was some kid. <laughs> Second order cybernetics and radical constructivism recognize the role of the observer. Hans von Glasersfeld stated, objectivity is the delusions that observations could be made without an observer. In the design field, this is widely accepted, and it is the motivation for practice-based research and research through design, which rejects the natural scientific notion of the objective observer, accepting the investigator as a part of what is investigated. And first I described the development from first to second order cybernetics as the development from observed systems to observing systems, taking the observer into account. This transition is oftentimes projected into the 1970s, roughly. Uh, again, what is largely unknown, I believe, is that Norbert Wiener has laid the groundwork for this with a science philosophical journal paper that he wrote while visiting Tsinghua University in Beijing in 1936. The title of the paper is The Role of the Observer, and in it he points out explicitly that the medi mediation of our experiences may be altered by our participation, which is in essence a radical constructivist argument. Design researchers and cyberneticians are still working on getting this idea recognized and accepted, but Wiener published it almost 80 years ago. And together with Rosenblut and Bigelow, Wiener recognized the importance of circular feedback systems, negative feedback and goal orientation, as it is achieved in homeostats, autopilots, and so forth. Cybernetic design theory is slightly different because it frames the design process as a circular conversation between a designer and someone or something else which can be imagined. It can be in a conversation with another designer, with a piece of technology, with a physical model, with sketching paper, and what happens is that I externalize something and I, happen, I, I, I pay attention to what happens and then it informs me that. I sketch something, I turn the sketch on the side, I see something that I didn't intentionally put there, but it gives me an idea, and I begin this interactive interaction that takes me, figuratively speaking, to a place that I didn't know existed when I started. So it's not a strictly teleological process, it is something else. We are not strictly in control, we are trying to get very often out of control. So uh, one way of explaining this is when you look at the a thermostat, it fulfills Ashby's idea of requisite variety. The bimetal switch has two states, on off. The furnace has two states, uh, on off, and the states are mapped onto each other so that there is no ambiguity, the system is in control. As designers, we try to undermine and evade this state when we try to misalign our vari uh, variances uh, to the effect that we get new ideas, uh, new trajectories, and against that backdrop then we begin to value what is con uh, conventionally considered an error or a 
to be avoided, like misunderstandings and things like that, personal styles and idiosyncrasies. We cultivate this, we don't uh, work against that. It's, it's a part of the process. And Wiener, he recognizes the circular relationship um, at the level of himself in his intellectual context. So in the book on invention, he's not necessarily talking about the design process in this out of control term, but he recognizes the inventive process and the importance of the intellectual cultural context that it happens in and that, that this is in fact a circular relationship. And with this argument he goes uncannily close to the work of Thomas Kuhn on the structure of scientific revolutions eight years later. I don't have time to talk about that, but that's quickly mentioned in the paper. Another interesting point about um, this circular feedback thing is that at some point Heinz von Furster demanded that a theory of living systems, since it has to be proposed by a living system, should account for itself. And analogously, we could demand that a theory of invention should account for its inventor. And Wiener fulfills this criterion with the book perfectly because he's not writing as an outsider. He's writing about his own practice. It's, and you get a very strong sense that his theory is subject to his expressing the, uh, the theory, but his expressing it is also a subject of the theory itself. I don't think I have to explain the difference between the trivial machine and the non-trivial machine to most of you. Uh, I'm skipping right ahead to the second last slide, which is my favorite part of, in the book on invention, where Norbert Wiener acknowledges the indeterministic nature of occurrences of invention and discoveries, and he likens those occurrences to lightning strokes. And what he basically says is we cannot really predict where light, lightning is going to strike, but we have a rough understanding of what are favorable circumstances and we can bring those about. And this has a very strong analogy to contemporary design management, where we say we cannot really produce innovation at the press of a button, but in Google headquarters, you give the creatives ping pong tables and stuff like that, wait for lightning to strike. So these are some point samples and basically circumstantial evidence that there is actually more in contemporary cybernetic design theory that originated with Wiener than is generally acknowledged. And um, since I know that I'm running out of time, I guess, yeah, I should call it a day. Thank you.